Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's HFTP ProLinks webinar, Back to Basis with Balance Sheet Reconciliation. Today's webinar is sponsored by SkyStem, experts in account reconciliation and variance analysis. I'm Barbara Summerero, your HFTP Senior Chapter Relations Manager, along with Brittany Brewster, HFTP Membership Director, and we are hosting today's webinar. Now, how do we unleash the full power of the closed process? Humble workforce. Well, today's presentation will cover best practices on how to think about the reconciliation work each month, each month, when best to do reconciliations and how they should be prepared and some common pitfalls to avoid. We are joined today by Nancy Wu, who leads the sales and customer success for SkyStem in the United States. She has spent most of her career working with accounting professionals to streamline the closed process, set up shared services centers, and has consulted for a number of years in business process improvement and technology implementation. She is also the host of SkyStEM's award-winning CPE webinar series and is also a contributor for CFO University. In 2020, she authored from week to days, boarding the mid-market financial close bullet train in partnership with IQPC. Nancy has a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Pennsylvania. And at this time, I now welcome Nancy and I hand the webinar over to you. Hey guys, thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you, Brittany. All right, so today we're gonna break down the anatomy of a balance sheet reconciliation and we're gonna go through it piece by piece. Um, I wanna talk about what each component of a reconciliation is for, what a proper reconciliation should have in it and also how best to support the contents of your cover sheet. Um, if we have time, I will also touch upon that review process, what your auditors are looking for, you know, when they pay you that very special visit. Um, to see your reconciliations. My name is Nancy Wu with SkyStem, and I lead sales and customer support for SkyStem. Um, we are based in New York City, and we make a software called Art, which is a month and close platform. And I actually see, I think, a few of my customers here today. So um, it is something that we put sort of to complement your general ledger system and just help automate that sort of last piece of the close. So your recs, your closing checklist, maybe your flex analysis if you're doing that, your variance analysis, um, all that with the hope of helping you close faster, better, and of course with um, fewer spreadsheets. Um, a couple things before um, we get into our first poll and get into the content. You can always visit us at our website, www.skystem, I know it's kind of a mouthful, .com, and that's where we are. Um, you could sign up for more demos there. Um, and, well, you could sign up for a demo. You could sign up for more webinars there. We do host monthly webinars with various partners, and that's how you sign up for our CPE webinars. Um, we also have a podcast where we talk about fraud stories, and there's all kinds of really cool occupational fraud stories that you probably haven't heard about because they're not sort of you know big enough to be like a Theranos type of thing, but they're really, really interesting. So we host those episodes there. And then we also run a um, LinkedIn group Group called the free CPE network that I encourage you to sign up for. You just go to LinkedIn, type in free CPE network. That's our group. When we come across either our event or somebody else's event that we think is interesting, offer CPE is free or heavily discounted. Um, that's where we post it. All right. So um, if you can, uh, Barbara or Brittany, let's go ahead and run our first poll and then uh, we'll get into the content. Hi, uh, yes, I just launched the first poll and it is how many people in your organization get involved in the close and reconciliation process. This is a single choice, so it's under five people, five to 15, 16 to 30, 31 to 50, or 50 plus people. So I'll give you everybody a few more seconds. Looks like people are still answering. And I'll go ahead and end the poll now. And I'll share the results. Here you go, Nancy. Fantastic. Looks like most of us today are joining from smaller groups. Um, and then uh, a bunch of us coming from teams between five and more than 50 people. 
Great. Fantastic. So before we dive into the makeup of a reconciliation, um, let's kind of just address why this even deserves our attention, right? When we think of reconciliations like, oh, so boring, so administrative, what is a big deal? This is a big deal because when we do it correctly, balance sheet recs are actually a really, really powerful tool that the accounting department has at its disposal to catch mistakes, find errors, and, you know, even fraud during that financial reporting process. And not only is it one of the more powerful tools to do so, it is also one of the last opportunities we have to do all of this, to catch the mistakes, to you know, um, smell the unruly stuff going on before the numbers go out the door in the form of our final financials. So I wanna share this report with you really quickly. This is the report to the nations and is published by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. So every two years they put out this report which has occupational fraud statistics gathered from thousands of companies. Um, and this report just talks about how fraud events occur, what type of damages and dollars that companies sustain, and also what companies can do about it to protect themselves. And this is available for free. You just go to the ACFE website um, and you can get it. So it's got like many, many charts and it's a really great read actually, but here's just one of them. This one shows how fraud activities are initially detected, right? Frauds are detected, for example, through a tip um, 42% of the time. It's a very powerful anti-fraud tool. That's why people always talk about, you know, get your hotline in place. Reconciliations. Fraud are detected through reconciliation activity 5% of the time, and it is among the top 10 methods of fraud detection. Now, 5% may seem like you know, really small. <laughs> However, if you look at some of these other fraud detection methods, there's often elements of reconciliations in them. For example, internal audit detects 16% of frauds. Well, that's pretty significant. Well, as part of their field work, as we know, they review our reconciliations, right? Management review detects 12% of frauds. Um, and we know that management review is part of when we prepare and review reconciliations at month end. Document examination, responsible for detecting 6% of frauds. Well, that's pretty much what reconciliations are, right? Looking at documents and support. External audit detects 4% of frauds, probably lower than you think. Well, part of their work also includes looking at your reconciliations. So this is just really to show that your reconciliations are an incredibly important control for safeguarding against errors and fraud. And this is just one more chart to kind of just drive it home. This one depicts the median damages sustained when a fraud event occurs based on each of these methods, as well as the duration of the event, meaning how many months the event was actually, the fraud was perpetrated before it was actually caught. So for example, at the top, you can see that when a fraud event is discovered by accident, right, it is likely has been going on for 23 months, and you can expect as a company to incur about $100,000 worth of damages, right? Again, this is a, a reason why you don't want to, you know, simply um, rely on your external audit or an outside party to identify a fraud event. By the time they get to it, you can expect to incur a lot more damages than if you had the internal safeguards to do it internally. But if you look down that list, fraud detected through reconciliation activities, for example, we're looking at like $74,000 worth of damages and just eight months of fraud operations. It's much less severe, right? And the reason I like to highlight this is because some of us were on the call today, you know, we're, we're looking to learn best practices. Yes, report back to the team. Yes, to persuade them to make a change. And to the extent that you introduce something new that requires a change, there will most likely be some amount of resistance or skepticism, right? Nobody wants to change just for kicks. And you can talk yourself kind of blue in the face on, you know, what we should do and best practices. But if you're not able to really illustrate why it's important to do things differently, right, we're going to have a hard time winning the hearts and minds of our teams to gather that momentum to make any type of process change. So um, that's why I share these stats with you to just illustrate the importance of this work. So there really is, like Barbara said, the humble workhorse of the accounting function. It's such a fundamental activity to any closed process, right, to reconcile our balance sheet. But just because we do it all the time, it doesn't mean that we all know how to do it. Most accounting professionals have never been through formal training 
on how to do reconciliations, right? It almost sounds kind of laughable. Um, it's certainly not in your CPA exam. So we all kind of just like learn on the job. And sometimes what um, our predecessors have done is not always the best or the right thing. Um, and, you know, they may not have done it correctly to begin with, or maybe the accounts have evolved and the way we need to treat these accounts when it comes to reconciling could have changed. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And I don't know if you know this, but every reconciliation has six components. It's just like if you need um, a visual reminder, just like the strings of a guitar, right? When we work on a reconciliation, we are going to go through each of the six components to identify information to put in them. Um, when we hear about the need to like standardize the reconciliation process to make them, you know, adopt consistent templates. This is what they're referring to is not necessarily to make every rec look the same is to have a unified set of components that each person goes through to prepare every single reconciliation. And you know, if you're thinking about your own recs and saying, I don't have six components. Don't worry, we're going to get to it because whether or not there ends up being content in each of the six components, we will know that there's been sort of like a certain level of rigor, right? When we follow these components, we'll know that there's been a certain level of rigor that's been applied consistently across the board to each and every reconciliation. And that's what we want. So what are the six components of a reconciliation? Let's get the boring one out of the way first. Number one is your policies and procedures. I know it's probably not the most interesting thing when we think about RECs and RECs in itself is not that interesting. Um, and that is why we tend to not want to pay attention to this, right? That is why sometimes our RECs look like this. Um, but, you know, this is the foundation of our reconciliation a well-documented set of policies and procedures really can make or break our rec. It can mean the difference between a rec that is done effectively, that is unleashing the power of the intended activity versus one that is just like a stack of paper, right? And we'll talk about this more. But before, um, so before we tackle a rec, we have to first understand the account that is in front of us. We need to understand the purpose, like what is this doing here? How is this supposed to work? Because once you understand the account and kind of like the history behind it, um, we can then begin to form work steps and expectations. And that's what the policies and procedures are for. So we want to generally document three types. Uh, one is the nature of the account. What is this account for? Why, why was it born? For example, is this a pass-through account? Because if it is, then guess what? I can expect probably balances to be zero at the end of the month. That and if it's not, we might have a problem, right? Is this account created for a, for example, specific event, right? And that event has not occurred yet. Because if it is, then I should not expect to see any transactions until the event occurs. And that could be important to me from a reconciliation standpoint, right? Um, more examples. Uh, where does balances come from, from this account, right? Is this coming from a subsystem? If so, you know, when is the interface? Is this the automatic interface? Is someone supplying something to me to then populate these accounts? This is all kind of good nuggets of important information that we should know and we should document that is going to be really important when it comes time to reconcile. Uh, number two are, are the procedures. Um, this is what we sort of more commonly um, would document, like what are the steps, right? What do we do first? And then second, where is the location of our support? Um, what kind of anomaly should we be keeping an eye out for? That's really helpful for me sometimes when folks tell me not only what to do, but also what not to do. <laughs> And third, we do want to include any references to just general policies around RECs. So who's going to prepare the REC? Who's going to review it? When is it due? Um, how many levels of, um, I don't know, approvals does it have to go through, et cetera? Who are my backups? Are there any materiality thresholds? Um, this is all really good information that guess you guys probably have, just need to document that stuff. And then lastly, perhaps the most difficult part uh, is to periodically update these policies and procedures, right? It doesn't really help that we have this beautiful set of documentation, except that it's, you know, from 25 years ago. So what we want to do here is to make sure that we are consistently updating the policies and the instructions. And, you know, it doesn't have to be all the time. 
sometimes it's twice a year, sometimes it's, you know, as needed. Um, and, you know, some companies, they kind of just wait until your auditors get here. And then right before we update those policies. And that is also okay, as long as we are visiting this periodically. Okay. The second component of a reconciliation, and this is really important, um, if there's one thing you take away from the session today, this is it. It is to start the reconciliation with the ending general ledger balance, right? We're going to start the reconciliation by stating the current period's ending balance. Um, and I want to mention something real quick before continuing. When we say we got to reconcile our accounts at month end, what we typically mean is that we need to verify the balance on each account on our balance sheet to make sure they are correct. But we're looking to see if there's any items that are missing, maybe misclassed, maybe there's a mistake that needs to be adjusted or journaled out. Um, we kind of call this activity reconciliations as sort of a blanket statement. But in reality, there is actually a number of ways to do this validation. And they don't all involve doing a reconciliation. So the next portion of this webinar, I'm going to show you the most common validation methods, right? In addition to showing you what a true reconciliation looks like and talk about the differences um, between these different approach. So for example, have we ever seen this sort of rec? And I'm using quotes here if you're seeing me on video. So left-hand side here is this quote-unquote reconciliation. It starts at the beginning balance of the prior period, and it kind of just lists out all the stuff that has occurred, and then we arrive at the ending balance, and then there is a signature and a date. And attached to this cover sheet is a printout of the GL transactional detail, right, from our ERP that, guess what, looks exactly like the cover sheet, except in a different font. So this is not a reconciliation because the balance is actually not being reconciled to anything, right? This, what we're looking at here, is a transactional detail review for the period. Now, why does the terminology matter? Whether we call it a RAG, a transaction review, who cares? Well, it matters a great deal because depending on what we think this exercise is, we have different objectives. So look closely. We all know that when we do a reconciliation, we need supporting docs, right? And supporting documents should match up to a cover sheet. If I think this is a reconciliation, then I look at my supporting docs, which is this GL printout, and I see that the period end balance is 1100 bucks. And guess what? It ties to my cover sheet. I'm done. Hooray. I'm, you know, move on. But this exercise really achieves, I would say nothing, but maybe not a lot. It doesn't achieve a lot. All I'm doing here is demonstrating my ability to copy and paste. If I look at this as a transactional detail review, then the fact that my cover sheet ties to the GL is step one. Step two, I'm going to review the transactions, right? If I'm doing a true transactional detail review, I'm going to look at the transactions, all five of them, um, and assess things like, hmm, do the amounts being journaled make sense? right, based on our policies and procedures. Should I even be seeing these transactions? Does the number of transactions make sense, right? Why is five transactions? Does that make sense? Does it make sense that some of these things are being reversed out, right? Is that weird? Is that not weird? Should the ending balance be 1100 bucks? Maybe it's a clearing account. Maybe it should have been zero, right? A transactional detail review is not a reconciliation. But depending on what account you're trying to validate, this could be a great method to confirm the accuracy of the balance. If I have an old account that's not supposed to be used, you know, for the last three years, I might want to do more than just, you know, do the rec. I want to look at the transactional detail to make sure that, hey, no one is sort of using it as a pass through and maybe hiding some shady business there. The problem that we see all the time, however, is that when folks think this is a this is how you do a reconciliation and apply the reconciliation steps, which pretty much means that you'll be done in, first of all, two minutes because you're just preparing this, uh, you know, stack of favor, but it really achieves nothing. This, this exercise activates neither the power of the transactional review, because you didn't do it, nor the power of a true reconciliation. So let's turn this into a true rec. Um, I'm going to start by honoring the second component of a reconciliation, which is to start with the ending balance. I'm going to move this baby at the end, this 1100 bucks, to the top, right? When we reconcile, we're validating the entire balance of the account. We want to substantiate everything in the balance. So that GL balance, that 1100 bucks, is going to be supported 
by that GLD tail that we just saw. And that's fine. We're just going to use that printout to support just this line item, not the entire rec. Do we have policies in here? Let me see. No, we don't. Okay. So, um, so that's number one. The third component of a reconciliation then is the supporting detail, because now we need to have supporting detail, right? So now let's go back and look at this example. Supporting detail is stuff that validates a GL. So in this very simple example, we are going to remove the transactions, right? This is a deposit account. So we will identify the three items that almost make up the entire balance. There are two utility deposits, another vendor deposit, they don't exactly add up, and which is fine. The ending GL balance is 1100 bucks, and we've come up with $1,000 worth of support. We'll get to that mismatch later. Whatever it is that we put here to support the balance, we want to make sure that there is supporting detail to back all of it up. So in this case, we're probably looking for something from our vendors, right? Maybe contracts um, that we can attach each of the three contracts here that would prove to an independent party that, hey, the deposit amounts should be 500 bucks, 400 bucks, 1000 bucks, and not some other amount. So here's a good example of why you don't want to just be reviewing your current period transactions, right? Why we're just Xing that whole left-hand side out. These items go way back to like 2010. Right, on two of these items. So if you're just reviewing the current month's transactional detail, you'll never get a chance to visit these two old items. Why is that important? Well, maybe the amounts were wrong and no one caught it for years, number one. Or maybe we should have been demanding these deposits back because we switched vendors. And it is only by looking and substantiating the entire period's ending balance by you know, having and understanding the underlying supporting detail, by understanding the account in general, will we catch something like this? All right, uh, before we move on to complete this rec and talk about the other components, Barbara, let's go ahead and run our second poll. Sure, the second poll has to do with policy and procedures. Everybody should see it now. And the question is, what are some examples of policy and procedures to document the reconciliation? Uh, what the account is used for? What type of activity should we not expect to see? The names of team members and backups who prepare, oh, sorry, I cut it off for me, who prepare and review the account or all of the above? Um, people are still selecting their answer. Um, Looks like it's slowing down a bit. Give you a few more seconds before I going to close the poll. And I will share the results. Great. It looks like most of us got it right. Yes. What are some examples of policies and procedures to document in your rec? It's all of them. It's the nature of the account, what it's used for, is what type of activity should we not expect to see. That is often really helpful. Um, and of course, the names and backups of people who prepare that work. And we want to be updating that periodically. OK, so going back to this rec, let's talk about these backups, right? We talk about, well, these recs need backup. It needs support all the time. Well, there's a little bit of science to it. Um, we want to be careful when we're looking for supporting evidence to back up our rec because not all support is created equal. So we're going to break it down. In general, there are, this is probably more knowledge on reconciliations than you ever wanted to know, but there are generally three types of supporting documentation. One, first up, is called third-party information, okay? This type of support consists of information that comes from outside your organization. The most common example is the bank statement. It's generated by a third party, and we use that statement to reconcile our bank account, all right? Um, this is called third-party information. Other types of third-party info could be like investment account statements, maybe um, letters from the government or a regulatory body, invoices that comes from your vendors. Third-party information is generally considered pretty strong when it comes to supporting an item in your rec because they come from the outside world and hence generally more objective, right? Um, could there be collusion for fraud? Yes, but generally more objective. <clears throat> 
excuse me, the second type of reconciliation support is the kind that generates internally from your organization's IT systems. So it comes from your internal in from the organization, but it comes from systems. So this is like your subledgers, your payroll printouts, your fixed assets, system reports, inventory reports. This is also considered very strong support because typically these systems have internal checks and balances to make sure that you know data is reasonably accurate. Um, and then the last type of support, we really just generally call like an analysis, an internal analysis. These are documents that are generally uh, generally generated internally and manually, right? So this is where many of our reconciliations fall in terms of supporting documentations. For many of our recs, there is not third-party information that we can use to substantiate our balances. There is not any subsystem reports, right, that we could use. So we produce what? We produce a calculation generally in Excel. Like, for example, we do an allowance for bad debt right? That is typically a calculation. We age out the receivables, we do the buckets, we do the percentages. Um, and that is all fine. Deferred revenue is another great example, um, huge spreadsheets, right? And it's all fine as long as it is thoughtfully produced. So when you're coming up with supporting documentation to tack onto a reconciliation, just keep in mind these three types of support and choose your support in this order. If you're able to support the balance or part of the balance on your rec with third party information, always opt to go for that first, right? If that's not available, then look for subsystem report. If that's not available, then we will default to internal analysis. And of course, sometimes you'll need a combination of two or three of the different types, right? When we reconcile AR, we're going to A, tie to the subledger. Right. B, we probably want to do some sort of roll forward. Right. That's an internal analysis combined with a subsystem report. Um, that is also why, for example, I don't know if you ever thought about it. Why do we reconcile cash to the bank statement? Why not to some other thing? <laughs> well, it's because it's a third party document um, and it's the best document to reconcile to. What you don't want to do uh, when you're preparing support is to take at face value any sort of informal communication or anything that doesn't seem like it's getting to an ultimate data source. For example, we've seen, we've all seen reconciliations that are supported by journal entries, right? And when we look at those entries, we see that they're not supported. So while seeing this journal entry itself doesn't exactly give me comfort that the amount is right, right? It's just a cover sheet for your journal process. We want to get to the true source to confidently validate the amount and perhaps even find out whether we should have booked this entry to begin with. And that true source could validate our recs, but not the cover sheet for your journal. Or how about this? I've seen plenty of this. <clears throat> we get an email from a colleague or someone from another department that just says, let's accrue $55,000 this quarter. Okay, right. Um, let's dig a little bit deeper, right? There's got to be some deeper rationale as to why it's $55,000. Why is it not $60,000? Maybe there are meeting minutes we can determine that. Maybe there's a calculation or some sort of logic that we can gather that's going to better serve as support. And those are the things we need to collect and we need to document. So when in doubt, here's a good guide as to what to use as a support. So number one, subledger detail, right? Uh, external or third-party information from vendors or customers, um, internal official documents like minutes or press release, for example. Love, love, love. These are all great support for your recs. Journal entries, it kind of depends. It could be pretty strong if the entries themselves are well supported, um, if they have true source behind it. Otherwise, it's no good. Internal emails, um, they're typically considered pretty weak as reconciliation support unless they have good rationale, good logic on how we arrived at the balance or the adjustments, et cetera, okay? General ledger, period, activities, sort of the transactional detail, that's pretty bad. If you're using that to support the entire rec, you might as well just not do it. Uh, we want to stay away from that printout of the transactional detail to be the entire support for our rec. And of course, if you have no support, that's um, that's not good either. All right, so let's take a look at our little reconciliation again. We're still not tying out, but you know that's because we're not done. Um, now we are going to look at the concept of timing differences 
and adjustments. What are timing differences and adjustments? Well, they are items that we have identified to bridge the gap between the GL, remember the ending balance, and the sum of all of that support we just talked about, right? So in this case, so this is component four and five. In this case, we've identified a timing difference. We've, we've identified no adjustments, no GL adjustments. But we have identified a timing difference that should come through by, let's say, next period, hopefully, right? We got a refund on the deposit. It is supposed to be reflected in a GL, and it is going to come through soon. So do we need support for that? Yeah, absolutely. If it's material, right? Some sort of documentation to show that, hey, this thing, this event actually happened. Especially if you look at the date on this uh, return, it's uh, 2021. Well, it's 2022 now. <laughs> so um, adjustments and timing differences, they are um, temporary in nature. That's probably the most important part to remember is they're temporary in nature, meaning they are okay to show up in your reconciliation but for a limited time only, kind of like a clearance sale, right? And what is that time limit? Well, it's usually around 90 days. If there is a temporary item, then we want to monitor it on the rec um, and then try to resolve it within 30 to 90 days. And after that, unless there's a really good reason as to why a temporary item should stay on the books, we usually opt to just adjust the GL. So let's go back to um, our reconciliation. Oh, we're still there. Okay. So um, are we going to tie out? No. But it looks like we've identified 70 bucks worth of deposit returns that so far has been aging for many, many, many days, right? And here, again, it's just one more difference between reconciling in a true fashion versus reviewing your transactional detail, right? In this situation, if we're doing true recs, we're going to monitor this open item, right? This, this transaction date was back in 2021. So in a true rec situation, we can monitor this for a whole year to see whether it's going to clear. If we're just looking at every single period transactional detail, right? After the May 2021 period, you'll never see this item again. So maybe it clears, maybe it doesn't. We don't really know. Um, and that will be a mistake because in this case, there is a deposit that is on its way supposedly, and we want to make sure that we get it, right? So we got our timing differences in, um, and guess what? We still have a variance. Looks like we're $30 off. What that's going to do is go into our variance and write-off component of the reconciliation, and that is our sixth component. The variance is the sum of your GL plus or minus your supporting detail plus or minus your timing differences and adjustments. Whatever is left over becomes your variance. This amount is a mystery sum, if you will, that we cannot explain or substantiate with support at this time, right? Remember, we don't have unlimited amount of time to do this work. At some point, we're just gonna have to say, look, I've tried, it's not working out for this period and I gotta move on. The reason the variance is dangerous is because well, it's simply because we don't know what it is and we don't have, you know, an infinite number of hours to research the item. So the thing to do here is generally, again, we're going to monitor the variance for a period of time to see if we can explain it next month or maybe the month after that. Or, you know, sometimes it just resolves itself, which is the ideal situation. Now, once they get, um, once they start to age uh, for long enough, again, it's 30 to 90 days, um, what we're going to do is to write it off. A write-off occurs when we say we've basically given up on trying to figure out this $30 variance, right? We don't know what it is. It's not worth our time anymore to investigate it. We waited for 30 to 90 days. It has not gone away. We give up. We're going to remove it from the balance sheet. And that's how we know by going through this process for every single balance sheet account, that is how we know that we are, in fact, comfortable reporting this $1,100 amount for this account into our financials because we do this exercise every month on every one of our balance sheet accounts. We substantiate every dollar every month. We write off what we cannot explain. We monitor aged open items. This is how we report on our financials with confidence and that is why the reconciliation activity is such a key control because this is what a true reconciliation looks like. Now, let's take a look at some other examples that I found on the internet. 
this one here, sorry is blurry, um, it is called a roll forward. This is another way to validate an account balance. It's not a reconciliation, right? it's called a roll forward. So the uh, concept here is that you take the beginning balance of the period and then the aggregate ins and the aggregate outs for the period and you lay it out for X number of periods, usually the entire fiscal year or some sort of 12 month rolling or something like that. And then you see whether these ins and outs make sense in summary. This is a higher level review. This can be very effective in cases where there are large dollar movements and it helps to look at patterns and previous periods to assess reasonableness. So this is a roll forward. Now, um, we might think, wait, isn't this Roll forward, just another version of this little transactional detail thing that I showed you to begin with, right? It starts with the beginning balance and then it rolls into the ending balance. The answer is no, they're very different. The power of the roll forward is activated through um, two things. One, aggregation, meaning that you're not looking at individual transactions, but rather groups of transactions, ins and outs. And two, the power is activated through time. You need a long time frame. You need to see data in aggregate form through multiple periods, right? Because you're looking at patterns and anomalies in the roll forward. So in the right-hand side, in this transactional review on the right, you're more concerned with just sort of like the individual transactions and its validity for just that period, right? And again, the reason we want to name these methods correctly is so that we understand each method's objective and approach, and we can choose the best tool to treat each account review. In the example of a roll forward, we're not as concerned about pulling every supporting doc, right? We're really looking at trends. We're looking at things at a high level that doesn't necessarily make immediate sense, and then if needed, to research and document explanations. Um, we all know this one. Yes, this is a true reconciliation. Uh, we're tying to the period ending balance. It's being supported by an external bank statement. Uh, most everyone knows how to do a bank rec, but, you know, again, this is the reason why we do it this way and not some other way, right? Does it make sense to do a roll forward on the bank rec? Well, we can, but it's not going to be that powerful, right? Does it make sense to do a transactional review on the bank statement where we can, but it's not nearly as effective as actually reconciling to the bank statement, right? Not for this account. And that's why the bank rec looks this way. This one here is a subledger rec. This is also a true rec. So what's happening here is that we are tying out the period and balance to a subledger, right? In this case, there's a section at the bottom that kind of lists out the reconciling items um, for the subledger side and then the general ledger side. So for like inventory, we may choose to do a rec this way, right? Tying it to the subledger. In some cases, we might also want to do a roll forward, right? Because that could then further help identify any anomalies. And once a year, we may opt to tie out our balance to the physical count. Right now, that's a third party source document, right? Because now we know that we have something truly objective to go off of. That is why it's really important. Again, just to route back to the policies and procedures, it's really important to understand the account you're about to work on, the nature and the purpose of the account, the transactional patterns, the availability of support, the criticality of the account. Um, this all actually helps you determine the best way to validate the account balance because it may or may not be by doing a true reconciliation. Right? There might be other methods to do so. So um, let's recap the six components of a true reconciliation. Number one is your policies and procedures, getting that background information so we understand what it is we're dealing with. Number two, we're going to start the rec with the ending general ledger balance and not the beginning balance. Number three, we're going to make sure that anything we put in to support the reconciliation is actually valid, meaning that it comes with supporting documents if the amounts are material. Not all supporting documents are created equal. External information, third party information, most preferred. Then we look at internal subsystem, generate information. And then when those two things are not available, then we will look to internal documents and Excel spreadsheets and, you know, stay away from flimsy emails. 
Four and five, um, we have our timing differences and adjustments, which are amounts to bridge the gap between the general ledger balance and the supporting detail. The thing to remember here is that they are meant to be temporary in nature. And number six, whatever is left over from steps one through five becomes your unexplained variance. And if that variance decides to hang on for long enough, 30 to 90 days, it should be turned into a write-off to be removed from the balance sheet to keep it healthy and transparent and validated. So now your rec has been reviewed um, or signed off by the preparer. You are the manager. You're going to be getting ready to do this review. How exciting for you. Let's look, take a look at this rec. Um, what are we going to do? Well, essentially, we need to make sure that everything that we just went through <laughs> was actually done, right? Making sure that there's policies and procedures. Um, this, for example, is not a good example of a policy and procedure. I just don't have enough space <laughs> to write a real good one. Um, we want to look at, hey, did it start with the ending GL balance? It is, in fact, the latest balance, right? Sometimes there's a journaling thing that happens, and then we don't know about it, and then the balance is different. Is it supported with valid supporting detail? Are those supporting detail the best and the strongest details we can obtain? Um, are we monitoring the timing differences, right? This one here is aging for 61 days. Is that okay? Are those items supported? Is there a variance? Right? I do a lot of work with, for example, outside of hospitality, we do a lot of work with a financial institution. So banks, credit unions. So for them, they have a zero tolerance on variance. A variance is okay as long as we're watching it, right? And then after a certain point, we're going to get rid of it to make sure that um, it's not just hanging on. So, you know, if you're subjected to audit, then what you'll likely do is just like mark it up, light it up, check marks, common circles, show your auditors the proof that you've actually done this review. Um, and hopefully this reconciliation is well prepared because we've already spent a lot of time looking at it. But if not, you're going to, you know, kick it back to the preparer, make the update, send it back, sign and date you know, save it however it is that you do it. Hopefully it's not paper, but maybe share drives or something like that. Um, sounds like a lot of work for such a little reconciliation, right? Um, so if we have time later on, I will just talk a little bit about what automation means um, if we put that on top of your existing process. But let's go ahead and run our third poll first, if you can, Barbara. Okay, yes, I just launched it. And it, the question is, have you ever considered adopting a month end close solution? And uh, yes, I'm interested. And you'd like to know more by a private demo. I'd like to learn more, but I'm not quite ready at this time. I already have a solution. And I don't want automation in this area. So just having people, giving them a little bit of time to continue to answer. And it looks like we're slowing down. So I will go ahead and end the poll. Fantastic. And Let's talk a little. The, oh, here. Did you want me to, sh uh, I shared the results. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about auditors, right? When, um, when they pay us that very special visit, what do we need to provide? Uh, really, the game here is proof and it's evidence. So we're showing things like, hey, our accounts are reconciled regularly. Here you can see all the work that's being done is reconciled properly. Um, the process owners seem to know what they're doing, right? That's what that walkthrough is for. Um, we want to make sure our policies and procedures are well documented. They want to see that our work is being reviewed and is being reviewed timely. They want to probably check out your supporting documentation. Um, they want to know that there's proper segregation of duties to make sure that, you know, Nancy here is not preparing and reviewing her own stuff. It's a lot. Um, but as long as you're following the steps that we just went through, as long as you're, you know, doing and reviewing these recs on a timely basis, right? Um, not like two months after the fact, as long as you're not reviewing your own work, you will be able to provide all of this to your auditors very, very easily. The problem that a lot of companies face, however, really lies in how incredibly manual this process is when we want to do it right, right? Doing one rec, no big deal. 
or are you doing a hundred, five hundred, thousands of reconciliations as spread between, you know, not that many people, things can get hairy really fast. And remember, this is not work that we do when we feel like it, when there's some downtime. There is a very tight window during the close when this work needs to get done, um, after which the impact of the reconciliation, oops, should knock my water over. The impact of a reconciliation work loses, um, it is greatly diminished. So like if you do the same exact work on day one of your close, doing that same work on day 31 of your close, the impact really diminishes even though you're doing the same exact kind of work, right? Because on day one, you can catch mistakes and adjust that in your financials. You can catch fraud and get that whole process started right away. On day 31 or 61, whatever it is you find, first of all, it is yesterday's news. You're going to have to adjust it in the next period. And that just gives, you know, potential fraudsters another 30, 60 days to continue to perpetrate that fraud especially if they know you're not looking at this stuff very closely. So there generally is and should be a lot of pressure in a short time frame to get this work done and to do it fast, to do it right. <laughs> and that's generally where automation can really help you. And a lot of folks will ask like, well, you know, is it just going to do all our recs? Because that would be fantastic. Um, the answer is no, it doesn't. <laughs> the idea behind automation is really that it's going to take over the more like routine work. Right. So if you think about the checklist that you have to generate, if you think about all the signing that you got to do, if you think about, oh, my gosh, there's 500 reconciliations. But guess what? Not all of them probably deserve your attention. There's going to be some that are really super easy. Right. Maybe an algorithm can take care of it. There are going to be others where it's, hey, super difficult and you do need an actual brain to work on them. But there's a whole spectrum around your month and work. This is just a dashboard of um, what our clients see when they log into our site. It just gives you statuses, trending, and that sort of thing. So it's sort of a management tool. But there's a whole spectrum and range of automation that you can really leverage if you have the volume for it. So for example, our customers will routinely reduce anywhere between 10 and 40% of the reconciliation volume, right? If you reconcile 100 accounts, guess what? You're now doing 60 to 90 of them to begin with. We're gonna go entirely paperless. We're gonna have real-time alerts. We're gonna help you do a lot of the reconciliations. We're gonna help you make sure that all of that audit stuff that you might have to you know, sign, date, whatever, keep, um, all that's gonna go away and give you a central repository. Your team might not be all in front of you at this moment. Um, so there's a lot of these tangible and intangible benefits that you would get out of something like this if you decide to go for an automation platform. So um, if you're curious about that, there is um, on our website, we have lots of case studies that we can uh, that we can share with you. There are actually you can listen to um, demos from other companies if you're interested in that. People seem to like that. Um, there's web demos that you can sign up for online. Um, it's all on the website. You can check out the whole concept behind automation is to help you use the same number of people, but really expand the reach of not only what you can get done, but also extract more value out of the process. All right. So we work with a company um, down south. They probably, I want to say 30 properties. They own and manage 30 properties. Um, and each property, you know, maybe has what, 20 to 30 balance sheet accounts. Well, 20 to 30 times 30, that blows up pretty quickly, especially if it's a growing entity, right? You're taking on balance sheet. You are, you know, some of your clients are moving off. There's all of this complication just around managing the month and process, right? Every property is treated differently. It has a closing checklist, got the recs, it's got its own activity that it's got to do. And generally these companies are not, you know, there's not keep hiring, hiring people. So this is an area where you can put in a system and say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to offload some of this more mechanical work to a platform, right? Tell me which accounts I have to reconcile for which property. Tell me which one I don't have to do, right? Route it for me, um, uh, reposit the documents and you know, keep all this audit trail. Um, there's a lot of really, really great benefits you can get out of the process, even if you are doing really, really well today offline. And that's what most of our customers actually do. Most of them are actually closing really well on their own. So they're not like falling down on a close. It's more like, hey, we're a pretty mature organization. Help us get to that next level so we can do more with the same number of people. All right, let's go ahead and run our last poll. 
sure. This is our last poll. It is, which is not one of the six components of a reconciliation? Transactional detail, supporting detail, current period, end of the general ledger balance, variance, or write-off. And remember this one is, which is not one of them. This is a tricky okay. one. People are going back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh no. <laughs> Once, yes, so, uh, but it looks like they're slowing down now, so. All these I'll polls just, remind me well, of just, so many years ago when I have to take the SATs. Mm -hmm. After a while, it's more about, what do I think they want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> so here are the results. Looks like uh, transactional detail had, uh, what, 75%? Yep, and that is the right answer. Mm -hmm. um, a question here, what time frame have you found for implementation of your six point plan? Ooh, I like the sound of that, uh, six point plan. And managing reconciliations, min and max. Um, I'm gonna answer from two dimensions. Uh, one is with automation and one is without because I've had experience with both. So at least with our platform, with our automation platform, it's actually a three to four week implementation. Um, we, um, I was gonna say we slap it on, we gracefully implement it, um, but you know, we get your accounts in there, we get your users, we get your closing checklist, um, we get everyone set up all the templates, right? We call them standard forms and each one of those forms have the six components. Um, and then we turn on the site, train you guys, all in all, that's about a three to four week elapsed time uh, commitment. So usually our customers are kicking off the beginning of the month and they're going live the end of the same month. And there's like lots of videos and case studies that, you know, you can reference for that. Without automation, if you're trying to do this with, let's say, Excel spreadsheets, it is definitely possible. It's mm, depending on how many people you have, depending on what is the temperament of the team, um, you know, depending on the strength of leadership. Um, it might be longer. It generally will be longer. Um, it, it, it sometimes is impossible. And the reason is because if you're trying to get those six components in on a series of spreadsheets, you're essentially trying to force a tool, meaning Excel, that is made to be anything you want, and you're forcing it to be less flexible. So that doesn't generally go that well with people. Um, that would require you to put in a lot more elbow grease um, to make sure that someone is, you know, creating those templates and then checking and making sure that it's being used the first month and the second month and the third month. Um, it's just going to be a lot more elbow grease to get that put in. So it's not impossible. It's just going to be a little bit, um, a little bit tougher and certainly more manual. And that is the reason why, um, you know, if you talk to some executives, some controllers, it's not like they don't understand the importance of, you know, having a standardized reconciliation process. So they understand that, but trying to get that to happen with a team of, let's say, eight people who are not together, um, that's a whole nother story. So that's usually where we come across some barriers when folks try to do like internal process improvement and say, oh, we want to standardize the reconciliation. Okay, great. You create this template. Ah, nobody uses it. And that's sort of, that's the end of that um, sometimes. So you would need very strong leadership, first of all, um, to, to help implement um, that sort of standardization if you're simply rely on, you know, Excel spreadsheets and really no tools. All right, well, we're happy to answer more questions. Um, but in the meantime, did you wanna conclude, Barbara? Yes, people can ask questions in the chat or um, under the question and answer and continue on. But uh, I wanted to thank Nancy and also SkyStem for sponsoring today's webinar. And uh, as Nancy mentioned earlier, they do offer several webinars a month as or CPE credits for those who are looking for that. And many of these are also free, free of charge. Um, I also want to say that High Tech Orlando is at the end of this month. 
It's June 27th to the 30th. Sky STEM will be an exhibitor there and will be on the exhibit show floor at booth number 1249. 1249. And as a matter of fact, that is very close to the HFTP member world, which is the HFTP booth. So please stop by and say hi to the people at Sky STEM and also at HFTP. And Nancy, do you have any other comments or anything or? I see messages coming in. See, see you in Orlando. Yes, yeah. um, our team will be there. So do come visit us. We'll have case studies there, some swag. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you, Lori. Thank you for the kind words. Um, yeah, visit our website if you want to find more, skystem.com. That's spelled S-K-Y, like the sky, S-T, like Tom, E-M, like Mary. And I promise that's going to be the hardest thing you do, um, just to find our website. <laughs> So that's it. Yes. yes, I think also uh, perhaps when everybody uh, concludes uh, the webinar here, I, I think they will probably also land on your homepage too. So um, bookmark that site. And as uh, if for people who are collecting continuing education credits, uh, please note that you will receive um, an email tomorrow with the certification language on it. So please uh, look for that email. And for those who are earning HFTP certification credits, remember that you need to self-report. And you can do that also by saving a copy of that email with your certification language for today's webinar. Um, with that, I'll conclude today's broadcast. Thank you so much, Nancy. Very informative. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at high tech. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a great day.